Does reptile meat mixed with fortified wine sound appetizing to you? If not, then you'll absolutely understand why these old-school comfort foods aren't very popular anymore. The 1950s were a time of some truly weird food creations. Some of them never quite made it out of the decade, while others have managed to hang around in some capacity. Tuna noodle casserole wasn't invented in the 50s, as the recipe first appeared in 1930 in a magazine published in the Pacific Northwest. It was popular in the region well into World War II, where it gained popularity as a cheap, quick dish. By the 50s, it had spread to the Midwest, where it became a mainstay on many dinner tables for decades to come. That is, until the late 90s and early 2000s spelled its downward trend. It was the primary ingredient that spelled this casserole's end. After decades of continuous growth, sales of canned tuna began to see a decline in the 90s due to growing concerns about its healthfulness and sustainability. A tuna casserole. Yes. May I serve? Please. Many comfort foods today are pretty much ubiquitously popular across much of the United States. But in the pre-internet era, it wasn't uncommon for comfort foods of decades past to never spread outside a particular region. That was the case for chicken a la king. At the turn of the 20th century, it was both a comfort food and an upscale dish popular at restaurants. It features diced chicken with mushrooms and peppers served in a cream sauce and poured over toast. While the name may sound a little French, it was likely born and bred in the Big Apple. New York! Between 1910 and the 1960s, Chicken a la King appeared on more than 300 menus and restaurants around the city. But by the late 70s, it had already begun to fade. Long before a bowl of cereal became a breakfast table staple, another simple dish held a similar place. Milk toast traces its origins at least as far back as the 1800s. It starts with a slice of toast, spread with butter, torn into pieces, and sprinkled with cinnamon and sugar. Then it's topped with milk that's been heated on the stove and seasoned with salt. It's tough to say exactly where this simple dish got its start, but it is known that as late as the 1930s, recipes for milk toast were included in cookbooks. While you may not hear about it much these days, a similar recipe is a popular childhood lunch item in Hong Kong. It's called condensed milk toast, and it consists of toast spread with condensed milk and butter. In the 1990s, Sloppy Joes were a staple of lunchroom cafeterias and potluck dinners. But this messy creation was actually invented decades earlier. Some think it was created in 1930, when a cook named Joe from Sioux City, Iowa mixed loose meat with tomato sauce and served it on bread. Others claim that it originated at Sloppy Joe's Bar in Key West, Florida. And still others believe that it was originally a take on a classic Cuban dish, either Picadillo or Ropa Vieja, and that it was being served in Havana as early as 1917. In any case, Sloppy Joe's saw a rise in their popularity at the end of the 20th century, but then they all but disappeared elsewhere by the end of the 90s. While the culprit behind its demise isn't exactly clear, it likely made its way out of cafeterias due to campaigns to reform school lunch programs. I made an extra sloppy for you! <laughs> Fondue first appeared in cookbooks in the 18th century in France and Belgium, but the term has its origins in Switzerland from around the same time, when it was used to refer to a meal made from bread that was often stale, dipped in cheese to make it soft, and helped stretch rations during the winter. Fondue exploded in popularity in the United States in 1964 after it was featured in the Alpine-themed restaurant in the Swiss Pavilion at the World's Fair. Then Switzerland's cheesemakers banded together to create a union and prevent competition. They launched a marketing campaign in the 70s that featured actors dressed in skiing outfits, dipping bread, meats, and more into creamy pots of melted cheese. Home fondue pots then grew in popularity, and soon fondue house parties were also a growing trend. But like most trends, it faded away by the end of the decade, though it popped back up in the early 2000s. You can still dip all manner of appetizers and creamy cheese at many fondue restaurants, but DIY kits have once again disappeared from most store shelves. Do you... Fondue? 
White gravy was already a popular cheap military ration by the time of World War I when chipped beef made its way into the recipe. These thin slices of smoked salted beef were served on a slice of toast and then smothered in gravy to make a hot, simple dish to fill soldiers' stomachs. While it was gaining new and alternative ingredients, like parsley for flavor or tomato sauce to thicken the dish, chipped beef also made its way into the mainstream. Variations were a cheap meal for families during the Great Depression and later as a popular breakfast dish at diners in Pennsylvania. Some national chains have even offered it on their menus. But while chipped beef lives on primarily as a military dish, even they've altered the recipe to make it healthier, usually treating the chipped beef for very lean ground beef or ground turkey. Long before DoorDashers were racing through the street, TV dinners were a mainstay for American families short on time and looking for simple solutions. Frozen dinners as a concept were actually created before households had a microwave to heat them in. In the mid-1920s, Clarence Birdseye developed a machine that could freeze packaged fish to help it stay safe longer. A couple of decades later, frozen dinners hit the scene, but only as meals served on airlines. It would take until 1953 for 260 tons of frozen leftover Thanksgiving turkey to inspire a Swanson salesman to create partitioned aluminum trays filled with turkey and sides to freeze and sell to the public. And thus, TV dinners were born. The frozen meal industry saw rapid growth from the mid-50s until the turn of the 21st century, but 2008 marked the beginning of the end of this comfort food's reign, as frozen dinners saw their first decline in almost 60 years, a trend that's continued with only brief pauses since then. While the name might say egg, you won't find any yolks or whites in an egg cream or any cream for that matter. Instead, it has just three ingredients, whole milk, soda water, and chocolate syrup. What did you say, an egg cream? This sweet comfort drink is thought by some to have been invented in the 1880s, when a Yiddish theater star by the name of Boris Tomaszewski decided to recreate a chocolat at cream drink that he'd had in Paris. But most historians seem to agree that a Jewish candy store owner named Louis Oster actually invented the drink. He's also rumored to have regularly sold some 3,000 of his creations in a single day. The creator of the original egg cream took the recipe for his syrup to the grave. But most Brooklyn natives swear that the only way to make one today is Fox's You Bet Chocolate Syrup. While you can still find egg cream served in Brooklyn, they began to fade in popularity by the 60s and are largely unheard of outside of New York. Long before army soldiers dug into piles of creamed beef on toast, they were eating baked beans. This canned food staple first emerged around the Civil War. Then, sometime around the 1890s, someone had the idea to add chopped sausages to the mix, and thus a new comfort food was born. By 1980, beans and franks were widely available pre-made in cans. This combo was at one time such a staple of the American diet that it even had a holiday dedicated in its honor, as National Beans and Franks Day comes around every July 13th. But both of the main ingredients have taken a hit in recent years. The healthiness of hot dogs has especially been called into question many times in the past couple of decades. For example, in 2021, Researchers at the University of Michigan estimated that a single hot dog can shave 36 minutes off your life. You probably wouldn't consider eating turtles in any form to be comfort food, but not so long ago, turtle soup was considered a delicacy for the upper crust. It was so popular, in fact, that it practically wiped out an entire species. The diamondback terrapin was the turtle of choice for hardscrabble diners. Until it shifted from a subsistence food to an upper-class menu item in the mid-19th century. Sherry was a key ingredient, and when Prohibition hit, turtle soup went the way of the dodo. The terrapins eventually recovered, though more than half of all turtle and tortoise species remain endangered. Turtle soup eventually made a bit of a recovery, as it was found on menus as recently as the mid-20th century. But it's not exactly the easiest dish to prepare, owing in part to the difficulty of removing the shell and separating usable parts from the less desirable elements. Nowadays, it's seen as a strange delicacy in much of the Western world rather than anything resembling a comfort food. 
Am I not turtly enough for the turtle club? Is it steak, is it hamburger, or is it a little of both? Salisbury steak remains one of the lasting mysteries of 20th century comfort food trends, though it originated long before that. As reported by Smithsonian Magazine, Dr. James Salisbury believed that his chopped steak could cure chronic diarrhea in Civil War soldiers. By the time processed foods were becoming a staple of the American diet, Salisbury steak had found its way into TV dinners. But when TV dinners began waning in popularity in the mid-1980s, so too did the Salisbury steak. Since then, it's never regained its place in the world of comfort food. With much better fare available, a pulverized meat substance formed into a patty doesn't exactly scream comfort. Here's hoping it never makes a comeback. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Jello salad, an odd combination of name brand gelatin and just about anything you can find in the refrigerator, was a comfort food standard when Jello ruled the processed food world. There were variations for just about every taste or lack thereof. Onions, peppers, tuna, green olives, shrimp, carrots, spinach, and other various vegetables all somehow managed to get mixed together with this classic gelatin. With all these creative combinations circulating around domestic dining rooms, it's not too difficult to see what might have knocked Jell-O salad off the comfort food buffet. As it turns out, fish, vegetables, and meat suspended in reconstituted connective tissue ultimately aren't all that appetizing. Once cooler heads prevailed, Jell-O jiggled back to its previous self-proclaimed status as America's most famous dessert, and Jell-O salad became nothing more than a distant memory. Almost as controversial as the infamous Washington, D.C. hotel it's named for, Watergate salad was a picnic and potluck staple in the not-so-distant past. This combination of pistachio pudding mix, marshmallows, whipped cream, and pineapple topped with chopped nuts and cherries charmed visitors to the Watergate Hotel before making its way to deli counters and grocery stores across America. But now, it's disappeared just as much as a certain portion of former President Nixon's White House tapes. Well, I'm not a crook. If you think of Watergate salad as Ambrosia Salad's hipper, younger sibling, then you can get a sense of why it had its moment. The name itself may be partly to blame for its downfall. The Watergate scandal made a mess of the American presidency that still reverberates to this day. But also, the waning popularity of Jell-O pudding mix and Jell-O salads is what really did this fluffy comfort food in. As a culinary relic that's best left in the past, Watergate salad is now a kitschy reference to the days when government conspiracies were just reserved for the tabloids.